The trial is not the end of the story. It's just the beginning. Hey guys, welcome to Crime Over Cocktails. I'm your host, Tiffany, and today I have special guest, Jan Canty, PhD. Well, welcome. <laughs> well, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you are a psychologist. I am. About you 45 years now. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Good for you. I always found that so interesting. Yeah, it's... Uh, in mind. I like it. I, I would choose it again. You lost your spouse in 1985? Correct. July. July. What happened? It's a very complicated story, so I'll try to condense it down to this, the overview. I mean, it took me a 400-page book to describe it. So uh, in a nutshell, um, this is really abbreviated, but in a nutshell, we've been married 11 years. He was 18 years older than me. He was a psychologist. And when I met him, I was a high school grad. And I then got my bachelor's, my master's, my doctorate. And things were going pretty well until I got into my postdoctoral fellowship. He started to withdraw, become cranky, become avoidant, become preoccupied. I didn't know why I attributed it to his age because he was a lot older. That wasn't it. Really, in hindsight, what it was is he felt no longer needed. He felt no longer the authority. He felt no longer as if he was in charge. And in retrospect, I see he resented the fact that I not only had the same training as him, but I had more training than him. And it really bothered him. So he still needed an audience. He still had the same needs as he always did. So he sought them out in the company of Dawn Spenz, a prostitute, and her pimp, John Carl Fry. He started supporting their lifestyle. He bought them drugs. He paid their rent. He bought them cars. We got broke. We ran out of money. And they didn't take well to that. So they murdered him. And John Carl Fry dismembered him. And they drove, this was in Detroit on Casper Street. They packaged him up, drove his body parts in his car up to Petoskey, Michigan, northern Michigan, almost to Canada, and buried him in a bog on the campus of the University of Michigan Biologic Station, which is reserved for roadkill. So I believe there was an excellent chance he would have never been found had a confidential informant not come forward who was an accomplice in the burial, but not the murder. He came forward. And then the other thing that happened, which happened which helped the arrest was that John Carl Fry Sr. was so hated in his neighborhood because he pushed everybody around. He was a big bully. He had put women in the hospital left and right. He had bragged about killing other people and gotten away with it, that they turned, they turned him in. They called the police and the police had unprecedented cooperation in that neck of the woods that they never, ever got. So they found out where they were. They arrested them. They were arraigned. Then the media frenzy was like insane because it. I checked all the boxes. It was a fall from grace. It was salacious. It involved money. It involved a sex work. I mean, you name it. It was checking all the boxes. So the media was relentless with a capital R. They even disrupted his funeral. Oh, my God. When I went down to the morgue to identify his head which they unearthed 10 days after he'd been buried. They waited for me outside the morgue with microphones in hand and confronted me because I don't blame the media. I blame the public because the media does what the public wants. The media, let's not forget, is a private industry. It is made, it is a business like any other business you want to please customers. And if readership wants to know that, that's what they're going to chase after. Right. And they did night and day. They bothered me so much. I had to start writing down my phone number. I kept, this is before cell phones. I kept having to change my phone number and I had to write it down. I had it. I changed it so often. Oh my God. They showed up at my house. They showed up at my office. They disrupted his funeral. They were in the court. They bothered my parents who had retired in Arizona. So he had the arraignment. They were they were arraigned. Uh, they they chose uh, different trials. Carl, uh, John Carl Fry elected a 
jury trial. Don Marie Spenz elected a bench trial. Their trials were set for December and I left town because I had to go to the preliminary exam. I was subpoenaed to go. That's the only reason I went. I had, I wanted nothing to do with any of it because I didn't want to be on display. I didn't want to share oxygen with them in the courtroom. I wanted nothing to do with it. And moreover, what would it change in my life? I'd right. still be a widow. I wasn't going to bring him back. I wouldn't want him back at that point for what he had done. Because he had been involved with right. Don Spence for 18 months and left me $30,000 in debt, jeopardized my life mm-hmm. in the process, lied to me for 18 months about his whereabouts. I wouldn't, I, I it meant nothing to me. It was in my rear, I'd like, buddy, you had so many opportunities to back out of this. How dare you? How dare you do this to our life, to your life and mine? Squander our life savings. Right. I had assembled, for example, a scrapbook, a, a photo album of the contents of our house. I kept sensing something was amiss, and I was on this mission to feel safe. I couldn't put my finger on it. This is before he was murdered. So I assembled a photo album in the case our house burned down, listing all of our major belongings and the rooms they were in and photographs of it all organized in a file so that if we ever had to file an insurance claim, we would have even photographed the contents of our drawers to say, you know, this is how many scarves I have. And this is how many shoes I have. He gave that to them. So now they had the contents to my house, the layout of the house, the make and model of our cars, our phone numbers. And in the end, he gave them the equivalent in today's dollars of $350,000. So I wouldn't want him back. I agree. <laughs> wow. I had to go to the preliminary exam, and that's the first time I saw them. At the only time I saw them in person. And it was a media circus. They checked for weapons at the front of the courtroom, which is standard procedure. But they also checked for weapons as we went into the courtroom itself, because, as I said, he was, John Carl Fry was known to have, have a lot of knowledge about other murders in the city, if not himself. And it was a circus, and I wanted nothing to do with it. The defense attorney asked me very few questions. In fact, he stipulated to my and wanted me out of there ASAP. And the uh, prosecuting attorney only asked me a few very ridiculous questions like, did you give anybody permission to dissect your husband's body? Well, first of all, the answer is obviously no. But second of all, he wasn't dissected. He was dismembered. There's a difference. Dissection is a medical exploratory surgery done by a skilled surgeon. That's not what John Carl Fry was. And when he died and when he had dismembered him, he threw the body parts all over the freeway on the up that were non-identifiable. All he was high as a kite all the way up. They found it on the freeway, freeway ramps behind us. It was gross. So after the preliminary exam, when they were held over for court, I decided then and there, I'm not going to court. Nothing in my life is going to change. And I don't want to see these two ever again. I don't want to be a part of this. So I left town during the trial so that nobody could reach me. And they still would not let up. For a year and a half, they kept bothering me, the media. I did not realize until many, many years later that the reason for that was because one of the reporters wanted to write a book. So anything that happened, he kept it alive because, again, that's what the public wants, not just the media. Right. So when John Carl Fry escaped, that was in the news. When she got out, she was only she only was um, the judge asked me what I wanted for their sentences. And I got exactly what I asked for. I wanted John to get the maximum, which under Michigan law was life without the chance of parole although he died five years in. And I wanted her to only have drug treatment, probation, and volunteer work. And that's what she got. Why so little from her? She was not a menace to society, number one. Number two, taxpayers in Wayne County are going broke from housing these people. It's very expensive. Mm -hmm. Wayne County is a poor county. That's primarily Detroit. The taxes are through the roof. I mean, we pay federal income tax, state income tax, Wayne County tax, Detroit pop, property tax, and other taxes on belongings. They came into my office because where's my office was in Detroit. Oh, we, we're going to give you this amount of tax on your desk and that amount on your lamp and that amount on your chair over there. 
you're taxed to death because there's no money in Detroit. And I thought they don't need to go further into debt because of her. It wasn't so much that I had mercy on her. I had mercy on the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. And I did not perceive her as a threat to society. I did him, but not her. She was uh, very young. He was much older. She'd never, she didn't have a criminal history. In fact, she was voted the valedictorian of her graduating class until she met up with John Carl Fry. And I figured she'd bounce out of it. And she did. She's made a success of herself. So she was out and on the streets before I could even finish selling my house. But when I did and I moved locally, the media still hounded me. And after 18 months, I'd had it with the media. I'd had it with the pointing from people. I'd had it with people stealing from me outside my house. You know, these death tourists that like to come by and point and take pictures of themselves in front of your house. Oh, look at here. What do we have? I didn't know people did that. I had it with the whole thing. Oh, yeah. Day and night. Spotlights. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. They had blogs about it, even 15, 20 years later on the Internet. So... After 18 months of that, I cut all my ties, my friends, closed my practice, which I'd worked for 10 years to develop, sold my house, and did not speak of it, left town, and did not speak of it for 30 years. That's the story in a nutshell. There's a lot more to it, but that's the nuts and bolts. (laughs) That's crazy. Yeah. See, people don't take into consideration, like, the people who are going through it. Obviously, you know, like, that was a lot for you. And why, why do you think that is? Why do you think people don't? Because it's not them. It's not happening to them. But neither is the murder. And they pay attention to that. Right. I don't know. It's for their own selfish greed, I guess. I just feel like people don't always put themselves in others' shoes. Right. God. I've always said that the story begins at the trial. It doesn't end there. And that's where most stories end publicly. Movies, books, even research, scholarly research. You could find books and rooms full of research on serial murderers, which are very rare. But you want to find out research on homicide survivors? Good luck. We don't exist. And yet for every homicide, there's eight to ten people that are deeply and immediately impacted. And it goes down from one generation to the next because it becomes part of that family's legacy. My daughters are an example. I adopted them out of, out of uh, social welfare. Their mother had been murdered. And their grandmother, who I eventually tracked down, is, of course, horrified that her daughter was murdered. They're answered because it was their sister that was murdered. And they're bothered because it was their mother that was murdered. That's three generations that were impacted by her death. And so it doesn't end with the immediate family. It doesn't end with that generation. That's a lot of homicide survivors out there. Yes, there is. Yep. There are so many nuances that the public doesn't know about, doesn't give thought to, that researchers don't look into, that movies don't talk about. And that's why I'm on a mission to fix that through my efforts, because we are in the dark. We don't even connect with one another. It took me, as I said, 30 years to talk about it. And that's the impact it had on me. I'm not alone in that. So not only does society pull away from homicide survivors, but we pull away from society because society is not kind. People have this assumption, I believe, that, well, you'll get a lot of support from your friends, coworkers, neighbors, if your child or spouse or sister is murdered. That is not true. Instead, you're stigmatized. You become the poster child for crime in your neighborhood. And people, in, they'll gush to your support initially, but give it a few weeks or a few months and, and, and they don't want to be associated with the scandal. And it is very, very common for your social relationships to turn over. People pull away. You pull away from them too. So you're isolated. And then back when this happened to me, there was no internet. I didn't know anybody that had been in my shoes. I didn't even know how to connect with anybody that had been in my shoes. So it was up to me. And that's not unusual. Uh, Many of the homicide survivors I interview from my podcast, it's the first time talking about it outside the immediate family. It's very common. 
Well, it's good to do because, I mean, it's so important. You need to let it out and let other people know that they're not alone. I mean, grieving is different for everybody. And there's a need to educate the public what to do, yes. what not to do. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've had a guest on my show tell me that somebody, you know, that they barely know, like a neighbor, a coworker comes up to them and said, maybe after six, eight months later, aren't you over that yet? The answer is always no. It's life changing. But people ask that question and it gets old. I can only imagine. There's a lot the public does not know that they should know. Um, there's a lot to be said. There's a lot of research to be done. There is so much work to be done. And, you know, I'm in my seventies now. I only have so much time to do it, but I'm trying. I have, uh, the one book out, but that was, that was more of a true true crime memoir. The book I am coming out with in spring, it's like a manual. It's a 23 chapter book written in concert with 17 other experts taking people through the process, starting with the death notification, dealing with the media, planning the funeral, going to court, so on and so forth, down to long-term adjustment and parole and advocacy. And it's entitled, What Now? Navigating the Aftermath of Homicide and Suicide. That's great. People don't think about what's all involved. It is. It's never-ending. That's great that you decided to do something about it. Just for an example, here's another angle people don't give any thought to. I I bet if you were to ask anybody this, they wouldn't be able to answer the question. If you were to ask them, what's the financial fallout? Describe what happens financially to people who have murder in their family. I bet most people haven't even thought of that, let alone be able to answer that. And the bottom line is after five years, they're about $48,000 into expenses on average. Wow. From the funeral, loss of income, having to move, medical increases because your health starts to slide, you know, increased babysitting, you name it, it goes on and on. And it's not, and it's not with planning, it's comes from out of the blue. Right. Yeah, I never thought of that part. No, most people don't. Only, Only one out of 10 homicide survivors even have life insurance. To cover a funeral, many victims of homicide are, are young. And so young people tend not to have life insurance. And the few that do are usually turned down by the life insurance company to pay for the funeral. If there's any question of a crime involved, let's say they were chasing, being chased by somebody in a gang and, they're, and they got, they're going to deny that. So what's happening because of that is there's a slow but steady increase in families not even claiming the body because they can't afford a funeral or they'll donate them to body farms because the average funeral today is about nine to ten thousand dollars then you have the cemetery plot which is an additional twelve hundred dollars then the maintenance on the on the plot which is an additional five hundred dollars families just can't afford that especially if their spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend was killed and they're the breadwinner. Like in my case, my husband was the breadwinner. I had just finished my training as a psychologist two weeks prior. So I was probably earning the equivalent of, I don't know, $800 a week. (laughs) And I had expenses like you wouldn't believe. Because he left me behind in, in IRS payments, the mortgage, my car payments. He had his funeral, his office rent. And so that's where the $30,000 debt came in, which today's dollars is more closer to about $80,000 in debt. Wow. And I'm earning 800 a week. And his social security payout benefit was $225. I had to pay that oh all God. off. Oh. And that's just one slice. That's just the financial piece. That's not dealing with the social, right. with the legal, with the physical health problems. I mean, it, it's just, it's like an onion that just keeps layering and layering and layering. And, 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 and so most people go into this blind. They have no, maybe it's a good thing, but they have no idea what's in front of them. They're just taking it a day at a time right. because there's no instruction on it. There's no resource on it even. 
And even if you went to see an expert, let's say a homicide detective or a uh, ER doctor, because you have a heart attack over this, or a clinical therapist, they can only offer you a slice of help. Because if you go to see a clinical therapist, how can they help you with the financial piece? Right. How can the ER doc who's working on your heart attack help you with the social fallout? You know, so there's no crosstalk between these different dimensions of the fallout. And people don't even know questions to ask or resources that are available. And there aren't a lot out there. What have you found that is out there? Self-help groups is the primary benefit. They're not available in smaller areas, but we do now have Internet. And you can get some help online. But even most clinicians, social workers, psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, have zero to minuscule training in trauma and almost nothing on homicide. So they're going to learn from you being their patient. Mm. That's not a situation you want to be in. No. No. It's just not covered in training. And people don't seek out clinicians because it's so overwhelming and they probably can't afford it a lot of the time. So clinicians don't get experience in it. So you would think that in school you would learn that kind of stuff. So that's no. kind of eye opening no. to me to realize no. that that's not part of the training. Wow. They're so busy covering the broader because I think people lose sight of the fact that homicide is rare. You have a far, far greater chance of dying from a cardiac arrest or cancer than homicide. And so clinical preparation trains you for the most common disorders like PTSD, bipolar disorder, depression, generalized anxiety disorder, uh, health issues, that you know, your reactions to health issues, relationship issues, that they're they are not going to have time to even deal with something that the likelihood of them running into it later is pretty minuscule. Most clinicians won't, won't run into it in their lifetime because homicide is so, so rare. I mean, for example, right now, if you look at the news, it sounds like, oh, crime is rampant since COVID, murders are up. That is so skewed. That is not, yes, it's true that homicides have gone up, but they are nowhere near approaching what they were in the 80s and 90s. They were double what they are today. But the media doesn't present it like that. It is a trend that's gone up, but it's also gone back down. Instead, it's like, oh, be careful. You know, it's going to happen. No. And your chances of of being killed by a serial murderer are less than falling out of bed and dying. Oh. That's how rare it is. Wow. But not if you listen to pop culture. Right. They make it sound like it's all around you. It's not. It's not. Your podcast is called The Domino Effect of Murder? Yeah, without the the, just Domino Effect of Murder. Uh Uh-huh. Gotcha. In your podcast, do you explain to people what to do, what not to do, things like that? Or If they ask. What do you usually discuss? Yeah. I usually take it from the vantage point that most of the people I interview, and they're not all homicide survivors. I've had homicide detectives on and some others, but of those that I do interview, I consider them experts. I consider them as survivors that have been through the ropes that know what's works for them. And I want them to share what that in that something is to anybody else that might be listening. Yeah, no, that's great. Things like this need to be done because like I said before, the justice system is a joke. Well, as I like to say, it's the criminal justice system. It is not the victim justice system. It does not pretend to support you. It's it's right in the title. That's that's not their role. And that's why I didn't go to the trial. I thought they're not there to support me. In fact, you're not wanted in the courtroom. They discourage Hamas, unless you're under investigation for the murder. They don't want you in the courtroom Mm -hmm. unless you're called as a witness because in fact, here's another example. The um, American Civil Liberties Union that's working against homicide survivors' rights to have a victim impact statement. We are just not wanted in the courtroom. Sometimes what will happen is the defense attorney will put you on their witness list with no intention of calling you. And the reason they do that is because you cannot go into the courtroom as a potential witness until called. 
So in effect, you're left in the hallway. That's their goal. Wow. They don't want you in there. We are not wanted in the courtroom. And if we dare go into the courtroom, we're told to zip it up, to look forward, don't react, just be like stoic little mannequins sitting there. Because your reaction can be considered testimony and prejudicial if by chance you have a jury, which in most cases you do not. 97% of homicides are resolved by plea bargains. Very, very few are resolved by trial. And they don't want your, quote, testimony by crying, by wailing, by getting upset in the courtroom. So don't go. And they'll sometimes not even notify you the trial is on. I had, There was a case that was on this on the podcast serial. It wasn't that long ago. It was like two, 2019 where a young guy was hitchhiking and murdered and his family knew something was terribly wrong because he was very good about telling them where he was every night. And these people picked him up and killed him because they wanted the thrill of finding out what it was felt like to kill somebody. And then they dumped his body. Well, finally the family figured out what was going on because they kept refiling missing persons reports and one of the and they knew his route because he had been very careful to tell him where he was hitchhiking. So they knew the route. They knew the day he probably would be there. They filed the missing persons report and they they were accurate. It, that's where they did find a body. So the detectives flew out to Oregon to get a DNA sample from his mother to see if it was her son. And it was. That's the last she heard of it. The only way she kept track of what was going on was through the Internet. Wow. We're just not wanted in the courtroom. And it's not there for us. It's there for the criminal. So you can't, and, and I think a lot of homicide survivors pin their hopes on that. Like, I'll feel better because we're promised this closure. You know, that doesn't happen. And you're treated rudely. Your, your loved one is referred to as the body in courtroom, not by name. And if they've done anything wrong in their life, you can be sure the defense counsel will bring it up if there's a jury, to make it look like, well, he didn't really count. He was kind of a scumbag. So so it's not a fun place to be. And it's great graphic if they show evidence. That's another reason that some people don't want to go, that they like a, a, a plea bargain. But with a plea bargain, not only does the person accused get a reduced sentence, but you miss out a lot of information because that's how you get it is through the trial. There is no trial. So you'll just have to live with unanswered questions. That's one thing that always made me so upset when the defense, I want to wring their necks in so many cases that I would watch on TV. It makes me so mad how they attack the person who was murdered. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, well, they did this, 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 and this. And it's like, okay, that's not who's on trial right now. Who's on trial is who did the matter of fact, John Carl Fry's defense counsel was a real genius. He had it in his mind that he could get <laughs> the reasoning behind this escapes me. He had it in his mind. He could get a lighter sentence or a, a not guilty finding by having an all woman jury because the all woman jury would be more sympathetic because the defend the person who, who was murdered, my husband was unfaithful. I don't get that reasoning. No. no. And of course, they they took two hours to deliberate and, and they gave them the maximum. That backfired royally. I'm like, we're not that dumb. I mean, he abused women. He 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 sex tra- Right. Not to mention, he's a pimp. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What about that factor? You know, but it didn't really matter in the long run because he got on the witness stand and bragged about what he did. He didn't care wow yeah so it was a circus and it was a slam dunk and they were in and out and he got the maximum and he died of natural causes five years into his sentence which is good for the taxpayers of wayne county and then like i said she was on the streets in no time she served about five or six months we said she turned herself around so that's that's good yeah it's less for the taxpayers to worry about now she can pay taxes instead of using up money for taxes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Tell her uh, you'll take some in small doses. <laughs> yeah. she'll pay me back. Right. <laughs> so do you have any tips or anything for people who might be going through a similar thing? Things that people need to watch for? Oh, my goodness. Um, the first thing I would recommend you do is go see a physician. Because the physical reaction to the death notification is the first thing to show up. And it's the last thing to leave. If you have pre-morbid conditions like diabetes, psoriasis, high blood pressure, you're going to find that those are weaknesses that are going to flare. And you really need support. You're not going to sleep. Your blood pressure is going to go up. You're going to have indigestion. You're going to have dental problems. And so you need to be seen by a healthcare provider very, very early, within days. That's number one. Number two is ratchet down your expectations for the criminal justice system and for your social support system, because that's not going to be supportive. You might have one or two friends that will prevail, but don't expect this gush of support to last. It won't. You have to be assertive with your, with your boundaries. And uh, that means excluding the public from your house so that they don't steal from you, so that they don't knock on the door, so that they don't invade the funeral, so that they don't show up and mock you in the courtroom, all the things that can happen. But also because you can have well-intended people show up and want to help you, and your house is overrun with people. You don't need that more further loss of control. So part of the chapter in the book that I have coming out is how to direct offers of help, because there's a lot of things people can do for you that you don't have time for, but they wouldn't think about it. They don't never occurs to them. Like just one example would be you need somebody with some savvy with the internet to warehouse, to log in and, and, and save articles on the internet for you for down the road. You shouldn't be looking at it right away. And those can become invaluable later on in ways that you can't imagine in the beginning. And they're not always Mm -hmm. retrievable. It takes hours to do something like that. You could have another person, you could say to the another friend who wants to help but doesn't know what to do, this is my criteria for a funeral home. I want this, 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 and this. I don't want this, this, and this, and this. This is my budget. Go out and investigate funeral homes for me. I don't have time. And then when you come back with two or three names, we'll go together and I'll choose a funeral home. That's very valuable help. You could have a third person, would you please, here's some money, would you please grocery shop for me? Because you do not want to be out in public because you're going to be pointed at and scoffed at and ugh, it's ugly what can happen. Then you have important decisions to make immediately. Like, do I talk to the media? Because There's pros and cons to that. Okay. If you do want to talk to the media, that's especially important to do if it's an unsolved murder. You want to keep it alive. You want to keep the case in the public's mind to be on a lookout. Well, the best way to do that is to be on the good side of the media. So you do want to have some good relationships with the media. And there's ways to direct your message. And there's ways to select a reporter that should be taken into consideration. A middle ground, for which I think is probably the best option for most people, is to have a family spokesperson instead. Here's my message. Go read it for me. I don't want to talk to anybody. And you can direct them to take questions or not, whatever you want to do. Or you can take the third option, which is what I did. Is like, I wouldn't talk to nobody. I mean, Oprah called. I had all these shows winding me behind. I said, no, go away. Leave me alone. I am not going to be in the hot seat for entertainment purposes. I won't. Right. That has some fallbacks. I mean, there's negative, because then you can't, you don't, you can't, correct any misperceptions because you've not cooperated with the media. Like in my case, a sex worker claimed to be a close friend of the family and have all this knowledge about what happened. And she was interviewed on the evening news. I never met her before in my life. I didn't know who she was, but I had no input to correct it because I chose not to talk with the media. So there's pros and cons to each of those. And that's a very, very early consideration. There are special ways to address it to children if they are the victim, you know, the um, survivors, uh, let's say the children of the person who was murdered. There's the, you don't want them as part of the media and you don't want them interviewed. And you do want to communicate with their school about what's happened. And you do want to help explain what's happening to them, depending upon their age, of course. So you're in 
15 directions at once. You want to take down the, the deceased person's social media accounts immediately so they can't be hijacked and uh, sold. Mm-hmm. You want to uh, close down financial accounts of theirs immediately if, if you have the authority to do that because your private life is now open to the public and you just don't know the people that are waiting in the wings to take advantage of social security numbers, for example. But there's so much to do and you are not sleeping. You're exhausted. You don't have the wherewithal to do any of it because you're overrun with grief. That's your task. Your task is taking care of yourself and dealing with your grief. You don't have time initially to search out funeral homes, dealing dealing with the media, safeguarding your home, shutting down media accounts. There is so much to be done. You really do need the help of people, and people do come forward and want to help, but you don't need casseroles. You need people doing those other things, you know, but mm-hmm. they don't know what to offer. But there are things. I have a checklist in the book. This is what you can have them do. Have somebody take a role and pick a, pick a, cha- a task. There's 20 things here that they could choose from. <laughs> You know, maybe they want a dog sit for the night. That'd be helpful. Um, (laughs) There's a lot to be done and not enough energy and time to do it. Yeah. And then to hook up with the right kind of support group. The support groups are not created equal. Some won't feel like home. And once you find one, hang on to it because you're going to need it. Get a hold of a victim advocate. They, they weren't around. They weren't even thought of back in my day. But now we have victim advocates. And through the court proceedings, they can be extremely helpful. But after the verdict, they usually go by. So mm. by then, hopefully, you have other kinds of support in your, in your life. Right. And then the other thing I want to address that I don't think is talked about enough is the flip side of all this, which is a phenomenon that you may or may not have heard called post-traumatic growth. There's research by Tedeschi and others which shows that people that go through trauma that are not initially resilient can come out stronger in the long term for it because they find that they have been tried and and they've come out on, they've survived it. They look back and they say, I don't know how I did it, but I did it. They have grit. They are flexible. They've learned from it. They are advocates. They feel stronger for it. It raised their confidence and they become advocates for others coming down the pike and and that's something we don't talk enough about it, it's not that's not the ruination of your life it's true that many people about 40 percent, do develop ptsd but they don't stay stuck there the majority bounce out of that within a year and like i said about if they, the research says not so much for children but i'm talking about adults now about 70 percent develop post-traumatic growth we don't talk about that we should be We should be talking about it in school. I wish we paid more attention to how your brain functions with all the dedication that we do to how football goes in school. But we don't talk about brain function in school. We don't talk about things like how to deal with trauma. But the truth is many people will be have a a trauma as an adult, whether it's a car crash or a child becoming severely ill. There's all kinds of things that can happen, but we don't prepare people for it. Very true. Very. I like that, that they should take that into consideration as well. Like they do all these studies, you know, I, cause football is what people love and it's entertainment and da, da, da. But what about other things Life that skills. happen to you? Yeah. Exactly. I wish I had never taken a class in algebra. I'd rather have a class in how to deal with myself. I've never used algebra <laughs> since I left high school, <laughs> but oh, well. Neither. <laughs> Don't like math. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, that would be a very important class to have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or just a life skills life class. Skills. You know, what does it mean when you sign a lease? Um, what do you do if you're in a car accident? What to do and not do in a car accident? How do you understand the grid system of the freeways? throughout the United States. So if you're tossed out of a car, you look at the number of the, of the interstate and you know where you are because you know that if, you're, if it's an even number, you're on an east-west highway. And if it's an odd number, you're on a northwest highway. That's kind of basic stuff people should know, but we don't yeah. teach it. So anyway, there's a lot, of, lot to be done. And, and fortunately, yeah. because of shows like yours, there's opportunities to talk about it because 
Otherwise, I don't know how you get the word out. I don't. Uh, you got to reach big groups of people. I've spoken in international conferences for homicide detectives. I've tried to go at it that way because that's a whole other group that doesn't know a lot about homicide survivors. That's not their job. Uh, their job is, because they work for the criminal justice system, to find who's responsible for what tra- transpired. And then there's the other wrinkle of being wrongly accused of the murder. That's another whole other thing that I've gotten involved in with wrongly convicted murderers, people that were truly innocent. And I've, I've gone to conferences with people like that. And I've met with two or three individuals that got so close to being executed, they, they drew their blood to make sure they were healthy enough to be executed. And then they were found innocent. Wow. So we need to know what to do and not to do if we sense that we're being accused of the murder. Early, early on, I'm talking, very early on. What do you do and not do? And about the read technique. The read technique is a way of getting false confessions, forced confessions. There's a woman right now on death row, Melissa Lucio, who is scheduled for execution. And she's so innocent that lawmakers are coming to her rescue. Law enforcement groups are coming to her rescue. The governor stayed her execution, and still the prosecutor wants to have her killed. Why? Because she, quote, admitted to what she had done. Well, yeah, after 15 hours of being grueled, she was pregnant. She was special ed in her history. She, she was, she's bilingual, but she was a, a, a very sheltered person. And the interview that they did is now available on YouTube. And you can just see they just railroaded her into it. And at one point, she weakened after hours of testimony of being investigated and said, well, may, may, it was about her death of her t- a toddler who fell downstairs and who, by the way, had fallen down the stairs at a neighbor's house the preceding day. But that never got entered into the medical record. So that when she fell down the scare- stairs at her mother's apartment building, the medics pointed the finger at her for pushing her down the stairs and that got in the record and has never been corrected. And she's on death row. She's been there for years. Wow. People need to know that people are being about 3%, three to 4% of all executions involve somebody innocent that are later. It's like, oops, sorry, we goofed. We need to know about prosecutorial immunity and the, and the games prosecutors play and get away with because it's condoned by and reinforced by the Supreme Court. They they can enter illegally obtained evidence. They can enter for forced confessions. There's all kinds of tricks they can play. Why do they do it? Because the public wants a, a public uh, a prosecuting attorney that says, I'm strong on crime. I get convictions. And they go, yes, yes, we want that. Doesn't matter if they're innocent or not. We want convictions, you know. All right, they want somebody to pay for it so they feel safer. And the public cannot imagine confessing to a crime you didn't do, especially murder. So if you confess to it, you surely must have done it. Not true. I felt that way. I was like, I would never say I killed someone when I didn't, you know? But when you watch some of these tapes, the way that they turn it, well, then... How would you have done it if you think that you could have? And then you go, okay, well, maybe they did this, this, or this. Well, if you get one of those things right, you did it then. And it's like, it's just crazy how they turn it. And in the United States, police are allowed to lie to you up until the point that you have your own attorney. Now, after that, they still may lie to you, but it's not condoned in other countries. It is here. And they can say to you, we have CCTV footage of you in the vicinity at the time of the murder. How do you explain that? And it's totally a bald-faced lie. And I I don't know. I don't know why you would have that. And the the person's trying to think, where was I? And so the read technique, R-E-I-D, is being used. And if you look at the TV show, The Making of a Murderer, that's what they're using. That's what they use to convict uh, the nephew. He's... He's innocent, but he's, you know, he'll never get out. It happens. And so one of the things I'm trying to say to other homicide survivors is, which is very hard, they don't want to hear this, go into the courtroom with an open mind. Even if they confess to the murder, they they might be innocent. They might be. Just go with an open mind. Now, 97% of the time, they'll probably really have been the culprit, but not always. And do you want to have an exoneration 20 years down the road? Then what do you do? 
you're a homicide survivor that that cheered the conviction. Then they come to you and say, well, the person has been shown to be innocent by DNA evidence. And then the media plays back your footage on the news of you rah rahing the conviction. Tell me you don't feel like an idiot. And you're back right. to square one. Not to mention the real person, they're still out there walking around. <laughs> and some have committed other murders in the meantime. Yeah. And then you got to worry, will they come after me because, or their family members? Because I wanted them behind bars. And you start all over again. So yeah. you got to have thick skin. You got to have support. You've got to know the, the do's and don'ts of what to do early on so that you can keep yourself safe and healthy, so you can protect your children, protect your finances, uh, so you know how to deal with the media, so you know how to to get a, a good funeral home if that's what you want to do, or cremation. Uh, and then it gets there's a lot of nitty-gritty things that people don't know about, like can I fly on commercial airlines with the remains of my loved one? And let's say they're murdered in L.A. and I live in Boston. Can I bring their remains back on a commercial flight in a, you know, if they've been cremated? The answer is yes. There's there's ways to do it. You have to do it certain ways, but yes, you can, right? People need to know that you don't need to get a casket at the funeral home. They're going to charge you three times the amount that you could pay on Amazon or Walmart and have it delivered and that by law they have to accept it. I didn't know Walmart sold caskets online with a 12 day turnaround for the, for the uh, delivery up to 12, depending on where you're at up between three and 12 days. And it's a lot cheaper than buying it at the funeral home. Not as convenient to be sure. Right. But you know, there's a lot of people that are involved in your life after you have somebody murdered, whether it's a funeral director, homicide detectives, the media, neighbors, it goes on and on. And some have your best uh, best intentions, your best uh, needs in, in their mind, but others want to take advantage. And so you got to know where to draw the line, what questions to ask and other resources that are out there. And it's an impossible task to do on your own initially because you're not even thinking straight. As a matter of fact, here's just one example from a physiological standpoint. When anybody is faced with a trauma, it could be a car crash, doesn't have to be a homicide, the blood flow to the speech centers of your brain is reduced. So the blood flow being reduced to your speech centers mean that your speech centers are getting less oxygen too. And that is why immediately following a trauma and some reporter shoves a microphone in your face and you're, uh, 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 you can't even form your thoughts, that's why. You're deprived of oxygen to your speech centers of your brain. And that will be replayed over and over because that's the part that they get you on. They want that drama because that's what the public wants. I don't fault the media. They are private enterprise and they have to make a profit. And these days with reduced uh, revenue because of circulation issues, you know, maybe many people get their news in quotes on TikTok. They don't read papers anymore. And because of reduced revenue from advertising, they are just going to go for it when they can. They've got to make ends meet. And they're there as a business. They're not there as a public service. They're there to please the customer base. And I think homicide survivors never to, to lose grip with that, that they're not there as a social worker on your behalf. That doesn't mean that you won't find a kind reporter. You may. But be wary, be careful. And then you have people posing as reporters that are really just a nosy neighbor or vice versa. In my case, I had a woman show up to my office claiming to be a high school friend of my husband. She was pregnant and she wanted to express her condolences. I'm like, I don't know her her name. I didn't know her. And then she started asking questions like, well, are you planning on selling your house? And I'm thinking, what's that got to do with expressing condolences? I called security in the building and I had her ushered out. People don't care. Extremely That's intrusive. That's crazy. Are you selling your house? Yeah. Right. I had a neighbor who I didn't know. I, I made, I love gardening. And I went out in the backyard to garden to get some peace of mind. My, my parents flew in finally to help me with some basic stuff like you got to eat. So I was out in the garden just for a little bit, just to get out of the house. 
And my, this elderly neighbor stuck her nose over the gate and said, well, I don't think he was murdered. I think he was, it was suicide. Don't you? And I'm like, what? That? <laughs> and he cut himself up. Like, that yeah. doesn't make any sense. like, what gives you the right to say that to me? Right. Don't treat me like I'm a public figure. I am not. I'm a private citizen. But because you're in the news, people take take it as well. They can say anything they want to, you you know. So there's a lot you need to learn in a real short period of time. And and it's sad that it happens the way it does because people are just not prepared. And that's why I find it offensive when you have so many opportunities that are lost to communicate this because nine times out of ten, movies, research, podcasts, books, television focus on the crime and the perpetrator and a little bit on the victim that's right. it and those are Nothing missed opportunities for the survivors no but it's not all their fault either because i said we pull away it's it's a mutual thing they're not interested in us and we pull away so there's this big gaping hole that needs to be filled as a result well, that's what you're doing. And that's why I appreciate the chance to do it, to talk about it. It needs to be done. Absolutely. It doesn't end there. It never ends. I mean, I'm sure you still deal with things to this day, still. And it's, it's going to be with you for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. Still. It's life changing. We use the term trauma pretty casually in this culture. You know, there's even songs about it that are so trivial. and By definition, trauma is life-changing right down to the cellular level and the way your body functions. And you don't go back to baseline. It does not mean you're ruined forever. I'm not saying that either. But you don't go back to baseline. Like, say, your hurricane that you guys just had in Florida. There's a million stories that yet to be told about what's happened to people that survived that hurricane. It's life-changing for the many of them. They won't go back to baseline. If they witnessed awful things, if their house is underwater with their pets inside, that's life changing. And it's an insult to assume that, well, once their house is rebuilt, things are fine. No. Mm -mm. They'll relive that. I volunteered for Katrina. I saw it firsthand what happened. I was in Shreveport with the Red Cross and wow, wow. It's so devastating. It's heartbreaking. It is. And like Naples and all that got it really bad. And I just sat and I just cried because my heart went out to them. Oh, I know. You feel completely helpless, right? Yeah. And you're going to find along with a lot of those horror stories, you're going to find heroes come out of it that are totally unexpected. When we had the uh, bombing at the Oklahoma building, there was a guy that was recently released from prison for doing some very bad things. And yet he was working as hard as he could to help survivors get it to ambulances and get to the hospital. Cause it's, you just don't know who can, who can survive and come to your aid. You just don't know. We can't assume the worst of all people. Cause there's a lot of people out there that are willing to do so much to help. They just need direction on what to do. Right. So. It's the yin and the yang. <laughs> <laughs> so when is your book coming out? You said spring? Spring, hopefully. We settled on a cover. I Today, this morning, I got up early and I just finished editing it for like the 50th time. I keep finding little <laughs> problems with it, uh, but they're on me to get it to them. So I'm going to get it to them this weekend and we've got the book cover and then we still have to do the legalese stuff and we still have to have it formatted because it'll be on Amazon and they have their own formatting system, but hopefully it'll be out by spring. And I'm, I'm really very much hoping it'll help people. It's, it's like a, a, a cliff manual, you know, this is what you do. Uh, it, Cause it, it, I tried to be as comprehensive as I could without making it a 500 page book. It's a balancing act, you know, there's a lot. I, I made it so right. that you can skip certain chapters if they're all apply to you. Like there's a whole chapter on crime scene cleanup. That's a whole nother thing. We have crime scene cleanup companies that will publish what they do in cleaning up your residence without your permission on YouTube. In fact, what? Spalding, 
crime scene cleanup company in Florida is right now being sued by Sire, Mrs. Sires because Mrs. Sires' husband committed suicide, killed himself, and her teenage, I don't know if they're teenagers or preteen, twin boys ran across the video of the cleanup and were shocked at what they saw. The mother, oh. Mrs. Sires, didn't even know it had been videotaped, let alone released to the public. And so she's taking him to court for for invasion of privacy. Yep. They're in Florida. So there's a whole chapter here. (laughs) So, so my point is there's a chapter on that in the book, but you could skip over it if it didn't apply to you, or there's a whole chapter on grief in children. But if you don't have children, then you can skip over that. So you don't have to read it cover to cover. And I've cross-referenced it internally. So if you want more information, you can double back and go and get it. And then someone applied to you. If it's like, say, an unsolved homicide, you're not going to probably care about parole and court hearings because you haven't gotten there. You can skip over that right. part. I hate how in certain states, every year you have to go back for parole. It's like yeah. you re-victimize them over and over and over again to keep them in prison. And Some people like, choose oh, not to go it. because they don't feel it makes much difference in the decision of the parole board. And parole boards increasingly don't want us there either. There's a movement to get us pushed out of parole hearings because they said you don't have any idea what goes on in prison or their worthwhileness as to their deserving of parole. So there's a pushback that's currently undergo- undergoing. And about 16 states now have abolished parole. And people have mixed feelings about it. There are some people that say, yay, keep them in until they die. And then there are Mm -hmm. others who say, but the statistics show that first degree convicted murderers have a very, very low chance of recidivism once released. Federal prisoners have a 1.8% chance of committing another violent crime. And state prisoners have a 1.5% chance of recommitting another severe violent crime you have a much higher chance of dying or being harmed by a car accident than a released murderer from prison it's another statistic people a lot of cases where people just got out and then before you know it they're either molesting another child or they went in for molesting or something like that and then they come out and they up it and then they start either raping the statistics i gave you are just for first degree murderers not molestation Sex crimes is a whole different That's ballgame, right. but I'm talking about first degree murderers. Second degree murderers are even less likely to commit a crime once released. They are, they are one of the lowest recidivism rates of any crime because it's an accidental murder. But even those who deliberately planned it, they have a 99% chance they're not going to do anything else again. And yet people do want to keep them locked up forever and throw, you know, throw away the key. And so there's pros and cons to that. It costs, you know, a lot of money yeah. to keep them there. And uh, that's a whole nother show. I mean, I, I, I don't know. There's a lot of, a lot of, of information and myths out there that need to be corrected. Is my point. So I appreciate the chance to do that. Absolutely. What is the name of the book? The one that's coming out is called What Now? Navigating the Aftermath of Homicide and Suicide. And the other one is called A Life Divided. The first one, but that's more just of a true crime memoir. And um, I right. waited thirty Is that years on to Amazon write that. as well. Yeah, and I had the coolest thing happen. This guy did not know a sound engineer called me and offered free to have me do the um, audio version of the book. That's like ten thousand dollar gift. That's about how much it costs to do an audio book to go studio time. Really, and I thought, you know, the old saying: "If it's too wow. good, it must not be true." He he was on the on the level. He was legit. So I flew back to Detroit. I spent three weeks there. I was very dehydrating. I hadn't expected that. And he was very patient with me because I'm not a I'm not an expert actor, you know. He was very patient with me. We got it done. So now it's available in audio format as well. He's a great guy. He does That's all my. Great. He was wonderful. He, ben uh, Lance is his name. And he also does all the editing for my podcast now. I hired him to do that. He's a wonderful sound engineer. And uh, 
very patient with me because I, this is not my area of expertise, but he's very kind. I've met the most amazing people along the way. That's one thing else I want to add is that I have networked the most amazing people through that pod- podcasting. I have found is like a little world and person A leads to person B leads to person C. And before you know it, you're talking to somebody in Israel, you know, it's the middle of the night for them in the morning for you or vice versa. And it's amazing the connections you can make. And Absolutely. I have found podcasters to be extremely generous positive uh people they they want to help one another and it's like its own little world and i i really resisted doing it when my daughter and my other i have a family member who does crime scene cleanup for a living in south carolina diligent decon and she was the one that recommended that i get into it and i'm like i don't know i don't know a thing about podcasting oh you should really try it well i happened to be being interviewed at that time uh, by Javier at Laeva, who does pretend podcast and criminal conduct. He was the one that nudged me along too. And, and anytime I emailed him, boom, he got right back to me. He was so helpful. And so that's how I got my footing. And again, A led to B led to C. And now it's in it. I'll be starting its fourth season soon recording and it's heard in 20 countries. Wow. Good and for you. I'm happy with it because I've met people that are just inspiring. I mean, I, that's that's an understatement, really, for how I feel about my guests. I really do. I, yeah. I, I admire them. I've learned from them. I want to encourage them. And they have so much knowledge to share. And they didn't even know it till they got in front of a microphone. It's just internal to them. And they're 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 insightful and they're positive and giving and they're just cool. I I, I feel blessed by that. I really do. And that's not something that I would have ever thought of at the very beginning of all this mess, that it would have landed me in that kind of a network. But it's it's true. And I've got about four interviews lined up for next season already. And uh, they're not easy to find, but when you find them, it's so worth it because they have so much to say. And I'm, I'm, I know that they will help other people who are listening, too. Yeah. And that's what it's all about. Helping educate, help the community. And I I look at it as like a big community, family Mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. Everybody has something that they want to share. There's, there's a goal. We all have a goal and it's to help other people. And and that's what's so great about it. And they do. I sat down uh, my first year and listened to all my interviews back to back to back. And I wanted to find out what is the common denominator? What am I picking up here? And I found out this, Every murder was unique, but not the aftermath, that it was very predictable what people go through. And that was an eye-opener to me. I didn't know that. And uh, I've not heard of two murders that were even closely alike. And uh, people have all different ways of coping with it. But they're all valid and they work. And they have great suggestions for how to their what they bring to the table for other people. and. I'm pleased that it is heard so widely because you just, you know, person A might not resonate with you, but person B might. So uh, I'm I'm really blessed to have the diversity of the people that I've had on. They're just, they come from all walks of life, all walks of life. And they each have something yeah. unique to say. And they're very inspiring. I feel the same way. And I feel inspired by you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I was determined early on. When this mess broke, I told my parents who were then alive, I said, I have no idea how I'm going to get through this, but I am. I don't know how long it'll take. I don't know what I can do, but I will not give one more thing to those people. They've taken my husband, my money, my peace of mind, my house, my privacy, my fertility. I went into immediate um, um, inability to have children afterwards. Uh, and never recoup from that. So I said, they're not getting one more thing from me. That's it. I've given all I'm given. From here on out, yeah. I got to build myself back up. And I don't know how, I don't know how long it's going to take, but that's my goal. And that's where I put 100% of my energy. And it took me 30 years, but I did it. You got to make sure you're ready. Sometimes you I think maybe people force it too soon. Yes. And you're not ready. That's right. Everybody has their own timetable. Absolutely right. Mm-hmm. Yep. 
Well, I thank you so much. Okay. I love you having st- you on. You stay yes. safe down there. Dry out and uh, rebuild. Yes. You've got a long way to go I ahead will. of you. It's a beautiful day today. Well, good. Maybe the sun will be out and dry some things up. There's going to be a lot of stories mm-hmm. that are going to come out of this hurricane. Good ones and bad ones, unfortunately. Everybody's yeah. got a tro- story to tell. It seems like by the time you get to my age, you, you're bound to hit some buff, rough spots along the way. Oh yeah. But yeah, so I'm glad you're safe and <laughs> that we were right. able to pull this off. I know I had to reschedule too because I had one on Wednesday and Thursday. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to have a You might not even have a roof. <laughs> so, exactly. <laughs> I'm glad it all went well. <sighs> yeah, yeah. Well, I hope that the people that are lost <laughs> are found alive and, and the, the best that can be had for the people that that didn't make it. I, I just feel for their families. It's a terrible way to die. Yeah. So Mother Nature has her own decisions, I guess. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, don't hesitate to call me if you need something. And thank you so much for having me on. It was a pleasure. I mean, you taught me some things today, so. Okay. It's always my goal. All right. Make sure you guys are on the lookout for her podcast and her books. Don't forget, crimeovercocktails.com is your one-stop shop for resources or if you want to listen to the episodes. All right, you guys, we're going to talk crime another time. Bye.